Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of sexuality and reality, where it meets at LDS Street and LGBTQ Avenue. Thank you for giving us an hour of your time, and thank you for spending a little bit of your energy and time to listen to another excellent story. I always say the next one is going to be better than the last <laughs> one. So um, I'm excited to have Paul here on this episode and you'll find out exactly why. The Latter Gay Stories podcast is your opportunity to better understand these intersections. And we thank you. If you are listening to an audio version of this podcast, we invite you to subscribe to this channel. By subscribing to the channel, you will help us uh, reach more ears and more listeners uh, by pushing episodes like these through uh, the, the podcast feeds. And we want to thank you if you are listening on your Apple, Google, iHeartMedia, Spotify, or other player. We invite you to subscribe to the channel and also leave a comment or rating on this episode. And thank you to all of those who are watching the video version of this episode wherever you are catching it. It is available online on our website at LatterGayStories.org, through our Facebook page at Latter Gay Stories, and also through our YouTube channel, also youtube.com backslash Latter Gay Stories. This episode and all of our others are available on all those channels. So we are social media uh, savvy and friendly as well. So thank you for um, thank you for following along there. We would also, just like our audio listeners, we would appreciate you subscribing to this channel. Click the bell for notifications when we receive or when we release another episode. And also leave a comment. You can like and share this episode as well through Facebook. It again helps us to reach uh, more people and build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ community. Now, what you came here for. Another excellent episode. I'm super excited to be able to welcome to the podcast uh, Paul Bird. Now, Paul, um, I'm excited because this, we kind of tease this as being a scandalous <laughs> and salacious episode. So, um, for all of those that might be hiding their children's ears, um, I don't know that that's overly possible, but I think you're going to find a very honest and candid episode. And we're going to talk about Mormonism. We're going to talk about sexuality. We're going to talk about sex. We're going to talk about agency. We're going to talk about um, consent. We're going to talk about missions. We're going to talk about worthiness. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff in your interview. So, Paul, welcome to the podcast. Um, let's give the audience a little bit of a... A uh, more precise view about who Paul is, and then we'll jump into your story. I'm Paul Bird, born and raised in Tucson, Arizona. Loved it, love Tucson. But hold on, yeah. first we should say the the, the shirt. Who's the shirt. on the shirt? Me. I'm on the shirt. My name is Paul Bird. Most people call me Paul Bird, by the way. Um, all of my friends, my whole life has always called me Paul Bird, and that's how I'm referred to. Just at work or school or play or wherever I am. So so if you are listening on an audio version and not catching the video version, you're going to have to watch. If oh. you want to see what Paul looks like on a shirt, you're going to have to catch the video version. <laughs> yeah, I'm wearing my face on my shirt. Um, I live in my car at the moment. I haven't paid rent since January. I'm real proud of that. And um, so I only have like so much room in my car for clothes. And mostly I just wear this T-shirt. Um, I want everybody to know who I am right away. Also, when I wear a mask, like I want people to see my real smile. Actually, I'm not smiling on my shirt, but <laughs> I'm always smiling either way. And um, but yeah, born and raised Tucson, Arizona. Um, I'm a violinist. I'm currently working in wilderness therapy. Um, so I take troubled teens out for primitive living trips. Uh, I'll talk about that. Maybe I don't know. And before that, I was at the funeral home for four years. I loved the funeral home, saw a lot of religious rituals, saw a lot of grief and death, and just learned how to love a lot of different people. Um, and But as far as like my, my relationship to Mormonism, yeah, I was born and raised in the church, pioneer ancestors, grew up, you know, keeping all the commandments, reading scriptures every morning, going to seminary. I loved seminary. Um, but then something happened. You're, you turn out you're, you're gay, Paul. Like, <laughs> so it throws a wrench in the gears. I did not admit to myself that I was gay or had same-sex attraction. I also, maybe I should start out. I, I do identify mostly as pan, but I lean gay. I don't know. It's, it's a, I don't dig super specific definitions, but 
I think that's great. So for our audience, how would you define pansexual? Okay, pansexual and bisexual are effectively the same thing. Um, a pansexual person just doesn't perceive gender as much. Um, like it's not a hurdle I have to jump over to fall in love with you. Um, so that's that's pansexual. Like gender is like not non-issue. Bisexual, like just slightly definition is like it is an issue or like a, a thing that exists. But in practice, like they look the same. So don't get too hard on the... <laughs> Don't worry too hard about the strict definitions of them. And I also use the word gay the most because I think it indicates a, a big community and a, a lifestyle perhaps, or, or I guess I could say LGBTQ. It's an umbrella term that means a lot of different things. Yeah, and I that, don't dig super specific definitions. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I appreciate that definition. It's interesting just how people do self-identify mm -hmm. and, and how that, um, how that makes, how that works within their own, um, umbrella as you kind of talked mm -hmm. about, but I also think for parents who listen to episodes like this, who are trying to understand their children, it gives them a little background as to actually what those terms mean to the individual person. So yeah. Yeah. And I am not the authority on every definition in the LGBTQ rainbow. So you know, that's, that's how I take it. Um, but yeah. And then if you followed Paul on social media, and that would be Paul Bird. Paul Bird. On social media, you just wrapped up a, a, a gigantic hurdle um, and hiked the Arizona Trail, 800 mile trail. 800 miles. Yep. These little tootsies took me all the way from Mexico to Utah. Yeah. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah. I feel really cool. <laughs> and you do it again, right? Oh, yes. I actually would. I made like the last 30 miles were like absolute torture, which is stupid, but, and, um, I was like, promise myself, I will never take on this big of a project ever again. But then like, here I am five or six months after the fact. And I scroll back on my Instagram and look at those beautiful pictures I took all the time. And I just miss it. Living in the woods is a lot of fun. Um, hiking nonstop. It's, it's a really great time. And I don't think people really understand like what goes into hiking the Arizona trail. We're talking, I mean, Mexico to Arizona. To Utah. To, I mean, Mexico to Utah. And it wasn't, I mean, yeah, it wasn't the heat of the Arizona sun or the, the southern United States, western United States sun, but it was still intense. You are little, you did it on your own mm -hmm. by yourself and you literally were out there with almost no provisions, just hiking, living off of the earth. And mm -hmm. I think it's incredible. Like that is, that's just incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you the hardest part real quick. Just a little anecdote. Um, <laughs> at mile, around mile 250, it was like more monotonous than like anything else. And I was like, I think I get the point. I think I understand what it's like to hike a lot. Um, and then it's, it was going down into like Roosevelt Lake and um, there was a point where I just like fell down because I just hiked 250 miles and I just sat there and I did not have like the motivation to get up and I just sat and cried because like I still have 550 miles left to go. How in the heck am I going to do this? How am I going to keep my motivation up every night? It's like this is way too big of a project. I can't do this. And every morning I'm motivated again because I'm a happy person. So, but, but that like every day, you know, you start out so good and then you're exhausted, tired and pain and overwhelmed by the project ahead of you. Like every night, well, it's a, it's a lot. So, but I'm glad I did it. I would do it again. Uh, there's other trails I'd like to do as well. Perfect. So let's jump into your story. Where do you want to start with the Paul Bird story? The Paul Bird story. Uh, like any gay Mormon man in the church, like it's, it's not that unique. You always think you're the only one that has like this secret. Um, so, uh, and that secret does like eat away at you. So there is this one time we're going to jump right into it, friend. We're going to go straight to the trauma which is lovely, right? Everybody loves that. Um, one night when I was 19 years old, preparing to serve a mission, I took a long walk. Um, just to clear my head, I was upset about who knows what. And like, I was picked up by this guy at midnight or 1 a.m. And he drove me home. And like, 
before he dropped me off, like I did give him a blow job. Um, and so that's why I want to talk about like consent and stuff. Like at the point, at that point when I was 19, I was just not given the know how to say no or like, um, do I want this or do I not want it? Because there's definitely a huge part of me that wanted it. You know, like I, I could have jumped out of the car. I would have been fine. Um, but there's a part of me that wanted it. And so when you're, when you just don't have the tools to like confront that, like that whole thing that you, you want, but you shouldn't want and you feel really bad about it creates a whole bunch of really terrible mindsets. I, it's just a whole thing of confusion. Just having this sin on you, having this, who am I? What did I just do? Um, and so there is a big part of me that like that man, he, he's a fantastic man, BT dubs that like, um, in my mind, I, I made him out to be a monster. Um, I had to like push him away or like, you know, in my mind, think he was a monster just for my own peace of mind to like make an enemy out of this guy. Um, which wasn't fair to him, you know, <laughs> but it only happened once, never talked to him again, except like, and well, I did talk to him again, but I'll tell you that story. A few weeks later, I go and confess to the bishop, um, and the poor bishop it was not prepared to handle that. I was like, bishop, I have a sin I need to confess, um, and I just volunteered the information. Um, I don't remember what I said. And he just was not, could not understand it. I was supposed to serve a mission at that point. Um, uh, that's the part I wanted to get. So you're 19, you said. I was 19. And had you already put in your papers to serve a mission? Yes. Had you? No, no. Had you come out to anybody? Did your bishop no. know that you were gay at all? No. I th Like my first like loves were women, actually. Like my first real crush was a woman. And my first kiss was a woman and I got the butterflies in my stomach and stuff. So like I always had like this funny justification that I could like it was a sin or a temptation that I I looked at men as well and lusted after them. <laughs> um, and I think I don't remember where I was on the mission papers process. It was just like I was 19. It's what you do. I'm sure other episodes, people have said that. <laughs> it's just like when you're a 19 year old Mormon boy, that's what you do. You serve a mission. And um, I wanted to serve a mission. Um, there's a verse in the Doctrine of Covenants that says, I will forgive your sin with this covenant that you go and preach to the world. And like, I was like, oh my gosh, the sin of giving a stranger a blowjob will be washed away if I go and serve a mission. And it's a weird thing that, like, that was the thing I held on to. Like, I was like, I have to serve a mission and this guilt will be assuaged. Um, so I fought really hard. Uh, the bishop said, you're not going to take the sacrament um, and you're going to come back every two weeks and we're going to talk about your repentance process. If you're reading your scriptures and praying. And golly, did I read my scriptures and pray. <laughs> I was, I, like, half an hour every day, I read so many scriptures, said the most sincere prayers of my life, just begging for forgiveness, begging to serve a mission, and every two weeks when I go and see the uh, bishop, um, and he would still say, I, you're still not ready to take the sacrament, and that was just his opinion or something, I, I don't know what his adherence to policy was or something, but that's what the what he prescribed every week. He also said, um, we're going to keep this at the bishop level. The stake president doesn't need to get involved. So I was like, okay, that's cool. What did that, I'm curious what that meant to you. Did you, knowing that your bishop was, was keeping, I don't want to necessarily say the secret, but knowing that the, the bishop was keeping that confidentiality, confidentiality between you and he, or he, you and the bishop, did that mean anything different than would you have felt differently if he would have involved the stake president? Or is there any bearing at all? Okay, this is a big story, friend. <laughs> so 
Um, yes, it would have changed a lot of things. It would have changed so much, but in a very logistical way. Like my feelings, I have no idea. This was 12 years ago, dude. I don't remember my feelings. Um, so eventually I get the sacrament back and I wait a year to serve a mission. Um, just because I thought that was supposed, I was supposed to do. I don't remember if I said that to myself or the bishop said I needed to do that. Okay, so a year goes by. I'm 20, and um, I go to a new bishop because that bishop was released. Uh, a new bishop, he says, you're good to serve a mission because I had read my scriptures. I, had, <laughs> I don't think I even masturbated that entire year, which is crazy. Come on. And um, <laughs> I was so sinless, dude. It was a good time. And um, then I go to my stake president, and the stake president uh, – has an interview and it's the standard like temple recommend interview questions. Plus there's a question in there that says, um, have there been any seeds or misdeeds, sins or misdeeds that should have been resolved with the priesthood leader, but haven't been. And I don't know what came over me, but I said, no, everything's been taken care of. And he looked up from his, like, that was my words. Everything's been taken care of. And he looked up straight into the eye and said, what's been taken care of. And I was like, uh, my sins that I took care of a while ago? And he said, should they have been resolved with the priesthood leader? And I said, yeah, they were resolved with the priesthood leader, with my bishop. And he said, but not the stake president? And I was like, no. But he, he pulled it out of me. He was like, tell me what you did. And I said, I performed oral sex on a strange man, a man I didn't know. And he stopped the interview right there. He said, you are not serving a mission. You can wait a year, but if you come back in a year, I'm still, no guarantee you're going to serve a mission. And, like, I was devastated. This was, like, one of the most devastating points of my life. Um, Because, like, I had hinged a lot of my life on serving a mission. I had hinged my repentance and my guilt on serving a mission. And, like, in just... Two seconds. That, and I, I thought I would just serve a mission. <laughs> I thought I would just go. Yeah, I was just going to say, culturally, in the, in the Mormon culture, we serve missions. Mm-hmm. Like, you you just go on a mission. There, yeah. there isn't many other options aside from when someone doesn't serve a mission, This the culture within Mormonism begins to let these ward members start conjecturing and, and <laughs> trying to figure out exactly what was it that Paul did that made him not serve a mission or mm-hmm. so and so. So there must be a sin. There must be, because you will serve a mission in Mormonism. Yeah. But not only that, like, yes, the cultural uh, expectation and the, and the gossiping in the ward, which I look back on fondly. I didn't like it at the time, but I think it's kind of funny <laughs> um, uh, about the gossip in the ward. But um, no, I walked into this interview just expecting my interview to go smoothly and like get sent on a mission real smoothly. You know, I repented for a whole year and stuff. So it was just like smack in the face. Did not expect that. Um, <laughs> so at that point, um, moved back home. So that whole story was like at college, at Eastern Arizona College, which I'm embarrassed I ever went to that school. Um, but I did, I had a scholarship, so had to go, um, moved back home to Tucson. And, uh, so my home Bishop was like, so Paul, are you not going to serve a mission? And I was like, I'm working on it, trying to do it. Um, and he pulled it out of me. So I, I believe, I don't know what all went on, but I believe my stake president from college contacted my stake, my home stake president, Bishop, uh, President Hardy and Bishop Millet, and they were aware that I had committed a sexual sin outside of marriage. I guess that's <laughs> a sexual act outside of marriage. It was a sin. Um, so my Bishop Millet, he asked me to confess again to him, and I did, and he was actually really sweet about it, and, like, I love Bishop Millet so much. Greatest bishop I've ever had. Um... And he said, yeah, that's, that's okay. We're going to still work to get you on a mission, though. And Stake President Hardy, who is like angel among men, he's wonderful, absolute wonderful man. President Hardy, if you're listening, I love you to death. Um, President Hardy was like, your old stake president is wanting you to go to 
LDS Family Services to get counseling so we can like figure out if you are ready to serve a mission. Um, so this is, that's, it was a lot of flowery language that just meant conversion therapy. <laughs> it was talking to this guy and he was trying to convince me to not be gay. Um, and that didn't work. I only met with him a few times. I thought it was stupid. So you went to conversion therapy through LDS Family Services at the recommendation of your home bishop or home stake president? I, I don't know. Um, they made it seem like it was like a policy thing that I had to go to um, LDS Family Services. Um, golly, I'm forgetting the details of the story. Also during this time, just so you're aware, it's like I am giving so much grace to all of my bishops and stake presidents because I think they're perfect leaders. So I'm not questioning too hard about why I need to go to the LDS Family Services. I think it was just a policy thing, just like standard procedure. That's what I think, but I could be wrong about that. So, um, yeah, uh, it was stupid. <laughs> it was a waste of time, waste of money. So you did get the t-shirt, conversion therapy dropout. Congratulations. I, I, don't, I, I don't love um, defining myself by my trauma. I don't, I guess I just told everybody I went to conversion therapy, but like, I, it's not a problem. I don't care. It was only three hours out of my life. Um, and I served a mission eventually. So, you know, all's well that ends well. I, I don't give it too much of my, my sadness or like, I don't feel too much of a victim from it. In fact, it was just talking, you know, like there's much worse stories out there. Sure. And I, you know, my heart goes out to those people because it is humiliating for sure. It's also humiliating to like just be a 20 year old that's not on a mission. <laughs> yeah. Go, that goes back to the conversation about the culture. Yeah. Like Latter-day Saint culture kind of paves the way for so much of that guilt and shame mm -hmm. to, to come in. Yeah. Yeah, so it was a very humiliating time of life, but I pushed through because I, I don't know. It's okay to humiliate me now. Who cares? <laughs> How much time had passed? And so you visit LDS Family Services, which for those who aren't familiar with that program, this was a therapeutic arm the church had created uh, with a string of therapists. It, it now, mainly because of a lot of social justice discussion, and this, the needs of, of marginalized Latter-day Saints, the whole program, the whole LDS Family Services program has been revamped where they're no longer performing any type of this conversion therapy program or reparative therapy on its face. There are, there are still some therapists who hold these beliefs and a church that argued that they have the right to, to teach conversion therapy practices uh, if held under a religious umbrella. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, like, as you, how much time passed from the time that you visited with your therapist at LDS Family Services to when you finally was given the green light from your bishop or stake president to say, Paul, you're good to serve a mission? Wow. You see, these are questions for them. <laughs> uh, how much time had passed? I, so I met with the conversion therapist. Kent Williams, we name and shame on this podcast, I guess. <laughs> um, he he wrote up a little report that had to be submitted with my mission papers. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess, and so I had no, I, I didn't know exactly when my mission papers had been submitted. Um, from what I understand, and I, I don't have all the, what, what happened with President Hardy is that, President Hardy's the one that like wrote a different recommendation and sent in my papers and pulled some strings or like prayed for me or like stuck his neck out for me or something. I, that's what I believe happened because Kent Williams and my old stake president, what was his name? I don't remember his name, <laughs> but it was Bishop Molino way back then and he was not any good. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't know. Um, but eventually I serve a mission um, my papers are accepted right before the end of the year in 2011. Golly, I should have brought down like a clipboard of my timeline. <laughs> and Elder Bird, you're hereby, hereby called to serve in? Oh, South Dakota Rapid City Mission. Oh my gosh, like 
my brother went to Brazil. Come on, God. Come on. Like, I couldn't serve a cooler mission. Um, but, you know, beggars can't be choosers. So they sent me to the lamest mission on the planet. Um, yeah, South Dakota. There's more people in Tucson, Arizona than all of South and North Dakota combined. So, I, and I was like really into like people and culture and stuff and not just like planes and sheep. Were you disappointed or was it a, oh, do you, I'm curious question here. You open the call and it says South Dakota. And I mean, clearly all those things are going through your mind. Did you think maybe this was a punishment? Was this God saying, Paul, if you would have just followed the commandments, if you would have done better, I would have sent you to Brazil, but just be thankful you're serving a mission. Oh, those thoughts for sure went through my head. Um, my oldest brother actually served in the same mission, Morris Bird, great man. Um, and he had left the church in a very, like, he's, he's in, like, anti-Mormon ways of leaving the church. And so when I opened up that call and I got the same mission call as my brother who had left the church, like, it almost felt like an omen. It was like, God, are you, what are you trying to say here? Are you saying, I'm going to leave the church? Which, like, fair, I guess. <laughs> um or am I to replace my brother or, like, you know, serve the mission he didn't serve and return a stalwart member of the church forever? At? Like, so the, those kinds of feelings went in. Um, I no longer really believe in, like, signs and omens and or meaning. I think my papers went to Salt Lake City and somebody stamped South Dakota Rapid City Mission and didn't think too much about it. So that's what I think happened. And as you're serving, so it sounds like you, I mean, wholly prepared and tried to keep your life in between the navigational beacons prior to serving the mission. And I say this next part in like air quotes, but were there struggles with your sexuality through your mission? What was the mission field like? Oh, I dove into the mission head first and worked real hard because... Once again, like your sins will be forgiven if you work real hard, right? And I was a fantastic missionary. I had doubled the mission numbers, actually. The average missionary got half as many baptisms as I got, if it were about the numbers, <laughs> which it totally is. I was going to say, we all know it definitely <laughs> was about the numbers, if you've ever served a mission. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, and I was really in love with the mission. I, I loved all the wards I was part of, loved all the people I was serving and teaching, so... Loved all of my companions. Honestly, my favorite part of the mission was the companions. I, I just really am an extrovert, so I just love having people around. Um, at some point on the mission, I finally admitted it to myself that I was gay and it's okay. Um, so if, like, anything good came out of the mission, it would have been that. Like, And I don't know how it happened either. It was just, like, the beginning of my mission, I was like, hope nobody finds out, hope nobody finds out. And then after a while... I became more comfortable with myself, maybe. I don't... It's it's a weird thing. Because on the mission, you're not thinking about yourself at all. Um, you're thinking about other people. It's forget yourself and go to work. And I did. And just somehow in the forgetting myself and going to work, I had made peace with it somehow. Somehow without me even realizing it. So, grateful for that. Um, my last companion... At that point, I was like, I, I will eventually have to come out. It was something I, I thought. So my last companion, I was testing the waters, and I was, I was like, hey, Elder Powell, wouldn't it be so fun to have a gay companion on the mission? Don't you think that'd be so fun? And he goes like this, I just couldn't do it. And he just like gives me this death glare, and like, I was like, well... <laughs> Yeah, that would suck, wouldn't it? <laughs> Not coming out to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so funny. I think that's just hilarious. But um, I started coming out shortly after the mission to friends, um, and I wasn't going to come out publicly. Um, are we done talking about the mission? Yeah, we can. Absolutely. Cool, cool. Yeah, I was, yeah, yeah. Definitely we can. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Um, and like... The whole debacle of starting, trying to get on a mission in the first place, I had forgotten about that. I forget a lot of things, you know, you just, you just live life and move on. That's what you ought to do. Um, 
so yeah, started coming out um, <laughs> to friends and family. I wasn't going to come out publicly. I was going to keep it pretty secret because I was going to try to like get married in the temple to a lady. And um, I, was, I wasn't trying too hard to date women, but there was a few ladies. Was that because you thought your sexuality might change or did you recognize that, that you indeed could have been bisexual, pansexual, were you trying to put away the natural man and just fight against these feelings? Well, I didn't get married. Um, I think, thankfully, all the women I'm attracted to are smarter than I am <laughs> <laughs> and realize they don't want to marry a gay man. So, And if I'm to like expect that of, of the women I date, then, yeah, I can expect that of myself, too, to be honest about my gayness. Um yeah, I don't I don't remember. Um Yeah, I don't want to marry a woman and then have my homosexuality be a burden. Uh only because like <laughs> and I hate to say this Kyle, but it seems like it's not a really successful marriage recipe. There might be some that make it work. But I, I just know a lot of divorced people. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's super honest. And we've we've discussed mixed orientation marriages on this podcast mm -hmm. many times before. And, and a lot of the things that we're talking about in your episode apply to a mixed orientation marriage as well. Consent. Um, full, full, both he and she know what they're getting themselves into. Um, open communication, honesty, connection, compatibility. All those things factor into a healthy um, relationship regardless of the sexuality. All those things are important in a, in a relationship, but consent and communication and the fact that they both know what they're getting themselves into, I think are, are key factors in helping a mixed orientation marriage thrive. And we also know through research that the overwhelming majority of mixed orientation marriages fail. And why mm -hmm. do they fail? It's because that compatibility factor. Um, and we're also learning, growing, kind of formulating beings and so as we kind of the Maya Angelou take on this, when we knew, know better, we do better. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when we get further down into these relationships, we realize that uh, some things aren't just sustainable forever. And yeah, I, I agree. Mixed orientation marriages are tough. And those who find themselves in them, I think are working doubly or triply hard in order to sometimes just survive. Mm -hmm. And I would prefer relationships that thrive. For sure. So... That wasn't my destiny. Um, <laughs> grateful for that. Um, in fact, I've never had a boyfriend or girlfriend. I should mention that I uh, am a single Pringle. Uh, but then the exclusion policy was leaked, and it was like the really terrible part of my life because uh, the <laughs> Just didn't like it. I really didn't like it. it. Made me feel really poisonous. So this is uh, November of 2015. November 5th, 2015. The church uh, released, and we've talked about the exclusion policy many times on this podcast. They released a set of uh, dictates against uh, homosexual Latter-day Saints. They not only uh, deemed them apostates, but they also said their children, children of gay people, were not able to join the church. They weren't able to receive uh, rights or privileges or sacred ordinances. Uh, they were also excommunicatable. The church essentially said, if you continue in this practice, we will excommunicate you because you're now an apostate. Uh, it also was the force behind thousands, tens of thousands of Latter-day Saints who resigned from the church at the time. Mm -hmm. And still do to this day because of the effects of the November 2015 policy. Yeah, yeah. I try not to like focus too hard on my trauma, but like I think about it every day. Yeah, it changed my life. It's just some force outside of me and I was just scrolling the internet at the time and then all of a sudden your whole life is turned upside down. Um, what, what was it about the policy that impacted you so much? Okay, because I was feeling very good about my homosexuality. I, at that point, I was like, this is a gift from God. This is like who I am. I am at peace with it. Um, and we even started like the Gay Mormon Group in Tucson and it was fantastic. We got together for Bible study every month or something and sang hymns. It was just like a fun, it was a fun life. And um, I, I wasn't, I liked my gay little self. I don't know. I, <laughs> I like myself. I can't 
not like myself. Other people have problems, but like I don't. I really like myself and I like my gay self. So uh, it made me feel really poisonous. Um, made me feel very unwanted in the church. Like I couldn't contribute to the church and I love the church. Um, made me feel like, oof. I, like a lot of my friends were really upset about it. You know, the tens of thousands of people just leaving the church over it. And I'm like, dude, don't leave the church. This is your salvation on the line. Um, and like my salvation is on the line too. And I'm going to have to live with this policy just to have eternal salvation. So yeah, it's just a lot. And I'm sure any gay Mormon can relate to that. Um, so at that point, I got a few of my friends together and bless their hearts. We, we had a little party and I, I just cried to them and I told them my whole story and, and it was like a beautiful thing. And we decided to like get together and talk about gay Mormon stuff often it evolved into this thing called Ally Night in Tucson. If it was a great time. Just straight Mormons came and talked to gay Mormons for about 18 months um, during the exclusion policy. Also started wearing rainbow ribbon to church every week after the exclusion policy. Um, but it definitely like forced me out of the closet. Um, it could have pushed me further into the closet, I guess. But uh, I'm too much of an activist, I think, and too loud can't hide who I am, I guess. Were you received pretty well by your ward members? Did they, so, I mean, here was Quiet Paul. Imagine that. Someone, <laughs> someone seeing a Quiet Paul. But, but here was relatively quiet, sexual Quiet Paul, who all, just the policy comes out and then you just start showing up in rainbow. You start showing up um, more authentic. Did that turn off some of the people in your ward? Did you see any negative reaction to that? Um, there is a few negative reactions, I think. Uh, they slide off of me after a while. I, I was just going to say, I, I get the feeling that you, you didn't care. <laughs> like there, there wasn't anything about the reaction that you were concerned about or worried about. Yeah. And thankfully like Tucson itself is a wonderful town. Um, it's much, it's much more liberal than the rest of Arizona. So we're much more used to diversity in Tucson than, um, there's some parts of Arizona that are like, Mormon heavy pockets and I, I sometimes worry about uh, people in those wards um, but yeah in Tucson like my graduating class of 600 people there's only two Mormons in my graduating class in high school so like that's when we talk about like demographics I think here in Utah and I love Utah Mormons I think we're all so sweet and uh, really cute people up here but I think, like, there's a weird, like, saturation thing and, like, the culture becomes a little bit too much. But thankfully, people in Tucson just are not like that. Nobody in Tucson is saturated by any religion, except for Catholics. There's tons of Catholics there. So November 2015 happens. The policy unfolds. You start advocating more and being more visible. Your ward members seem to take notice. Uh, you don't care. But where do you how do you move forward? How, how, how does someone become authentic and honest and live to what you've called the fullest measure of your creation that way? Um, there was something Wendy Montgomery said, who is also an angel among us. Love her to death. Um, she said it once on Facebook. I don't, she probably doesn't remember it, but she was like, as long as there's any gay people in the church, I will be there to support them. And that's like a real thing. And I was, I adopted kind of that mentality. Is like, as long as Mormons are having babies, there will be gay Mormons, whether the church wants them or not. I mean, the exclusion policy did kick out a lot and, you know, a lot of kids committed suicide over it, which is terrible, you know, but like, there's still the gay ones. I'm still here. Come on. And I had a lot of friends like in the closet as well. Um, and they're, they're still here, but like, you know, they weren't as loud as I am. And I was like, no, we're creating a good spot in the church for gays. Like, we have to. It's like, it's whether you like it or not. <laughs> There's, I don't see, I don't see how you can kick out the gays. I don't. Do you see that? Like, is there a way to kick out the gays from the church? No. And when I interviewed Greg Prince, this is just an interesting side note, but when I interviewed Greg Prince um, in Arizona, of all places, yes. yeah, I interviewed him down in Mesa, uh, we discussed this and he 
uh, is of the belief that, especially with the church's emphasis on mixed orientation marriages and there being an epigenetic or a genetic <laughs> component to uh, homosexuality, he's like, the church literally created gay people and they continue to breed gay people by, mm -hmm. by introducing and enforcing mixed orientation marriages. That So Mormonism isn't a stranger to a high percentage of mm -hmm. queer folks. And why is that? I mean, I'd leave that question up to the researchers, but we are still, if you want, if you're really upset about the gay agenda and having gay babies, <laughs> we need to look at the straight Latter-day Saints who continue to create gay Mormons. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, it was just a logical thing for me. It was like, it's, it's got to happen despite this policy, which was a major setback, but you know, like, uh, I had fought really hard to serve a mission, so I figured... I'll fight really hard here too and and try to create good just a good community for the gay mormons in tucson um and it was fantastic place um so you ready to talk about my philosophies and stuff i am ready for salacious i am i'm ready for the philosophy of men mingled with some scripture <laughs> okay and i think the audience is uh i i hope the audience is interested in where you're going to take us because this should be fun okay um, so in the beginning of the episode, I had told you a little bit about my first sexual experience. Um, and in my mind, I had framed this guy as a monster that like committed a sexual assault against me. So I was living with that. Um, it is, it is like trauma. It is. Um, so I was living with that and like, that's, that's a, it was just a huge weight, a huge burden on my shoulders. Um, and I had lost contact with him. And, like, I never really had contact with him in the first place anyway. But, like, this, you know, my life had moved on. Um, seven years after the fact, I ran into him at a party. He was just friends with one of my friends. And I added him on Facebook. And I texted him. And I was like, hey, meet me at Tempe Town Lake. I have to talk to you. Which is, like... The worst thing, you know, you haven't seen this guy for seven years. And he says, I need to talk. <laughs> and the only interaction was like uh, uh, some weird hookup in his car. So, uh, so yeah, he was like, how are you, Paul Bird? And I was like, I didn't even respond to that. I was like, so we know why I asked you to come here. It's like, I need to talk. I need to get some weight off my shoulders. And I... I told him, like, I was hurt, and he apologized, and that was great. And we just talked about, like, his perspective from it and uh, who he told and who I told. He asked me, like, did I tell anybody? I was like, no, I've never told anybody. And he was like, oh, well, I told this person and this person and this person, which eventually got back to my bishop, so that's funny. Was he was he closeted as well? Yes. Okay, that makes yeah, more sense. Yeah, uh, gay Mormon. Uh, I uh, is he closeted? Is he gay? Who knows? I, I really can't speak to that because I've only... Um, but as far as, like, a non-committal blowjob, like, who could turn down that? I do good jobs, you know? And um, so, so yeah, uh, I can't speak to that because after that night, I haven't spoken to him since. But during that night, you know, I forgave him. Um, and I, a huge burden was lifted off my shoulders. So... I'm really lucky that I was brave enough and able to like confront somebody who was a monster in my mind. Um, and he's not a monster. And I feel really bad because like it was a big part of my story that I had like told a lot of people that that he was a monster. And um and I feel really bad about that. I don't think that was right of me, even though it was a trauma response. Um, but like, you know, the greater trauma came from me not being able to say no um, because not a lot of sex education in the church. So, so you know, just big mess, and I survived it and eventually made my peace with it. So I, I'm really proud of myself for doing that, honestly. Like, um, it was scary. I remember, like, texting him and then, like, grabbing onto my steering wheel. I was parked, and I was just, like, shaking because I was scared. I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to talk to this guy about about a sexual assault like that's that's crazy of me but i did it so been a much different man since that night actually i'm a lot happier so 
recommend it if if you can humanize other people you know it, it or humanize people who have wronged you like i recommend it it's tough it's hard it's unfair oh wow is it unfair but i do recommend it if uh i don't know i, I can't just say that right away there's so many gray areas and I, I can't just like put a general statement on all of them and i'm curious if you thought maybe that f- level of forgiveness was also reciprocal did he in that conversation did he see some benefits of having that sit down conversation with you he, i hope so um it was definitely for me i was the one that and I was really gracious of him to like listen to me. Um, yeah, like he did open up a little about about his past as well, and I was like, "Golly, he's he's been through tough stuff too," and he was just perpetuating tough like things. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't want to speak too hard for him. Um, so I, I do, th- and just recognizing through what you're talking about is just this importance of connection and the human connection. It just feels like you both desired human connection. You both Mm -hmm. needed that. Too often we just label these things as lust, but you both wanted to love and have a connection and, and to be able to have a reciprocal connection with a, with another human. I think that's vital. Maybe. It's it's hard to know. Um, I do lust a lot. <laughs> like that's that's <laughs> no lie. Um, so, and like I, I didn't, I wasn't in love with him by any measure, <laughs> by any stretch of the word. No, and I think I think there is a difference between being in love and and feeling love. Okay, f- feeling connection. Because mm-hmm. I think that is again that's an ultimate human trait that we all want we we want to have a connection yeah and at the very least he was my friend's friend you know i have to give him respect you know i'm not gonna throw out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak um so yeah uh i would like to talk about boundaries you know like at the initial it was the encounter in the middle of the night and you know i just did not have the boundaries to say no um but I don't know. I figured out in a very messy way. It's like, yeah, I can say no, and it's on me to say no um, when I want to, and I can get out of there um, when I want to. And there was a piece of me that like wanted it anyway. So it's, ugh, it's a it's a big messy thing. <laughs> I don't know if I'm I can even talk about this. This is crazy. Um, the Bishop Molyneux, who was in charge of my repentance process initially, uh, he was not prepared in the least. And the year after when the state president said, no, you're not serving a mission, I had concluded right then and there, like maybe a few days afterwards, it's like, I will never confess another sin. That is my boundary. I will never confess another sin. I will never have a worthiness interview with a priesthood leader. And that is a rule I've kept ever since. Um... I was temple worthy for like a long, long time. So, um, but I would just never like, I just knew if I had committed a sin, I would not tell them, you know, deep down I was temple worthy though. So it's kind of funny that, I, but I still had that, that boundary. Um, since learned about boundaries though, is like, those were rules for other people. Um, I'm putting a rule on, on bishops, um, they shouldn't be allowed to ask about my worthiness. Um, but I'd like to like re-examine that boundary. I've done that just over the past few days. Is like I, I'm not like bishops can do what they want, and I'm the one that gets to allow it to affect me or not. So that's a boundary, a rule I have for myself. Who is in charge of my repentance? Who is in charge of my relationship with God. Um, and those are rules for myself. This like all this external social pressures or like policies where you have to go confess sins. Um, those are like boundaries in a sense, but I think a more important thing is I've decided 
what has power over my well-being, what has power over my mental state, what has power over my emotional state. And I allow some people power over my emotional state. I give love to my friends, and that is giving them power over my emotional state. And I don't give that power to people who can revoke my temple recommend. <laughs> so, and like, there's plenty of good bishops out there. Great ones out there. How was that? I mean, so spoiler alert. Um, and maybe I want you to define your current status in the church oh. and how you, how you define um, your activity rate in Mormonism. But how does that benefit this, this new epiphany of, of boundaries and understanding how boundaries best affect you. How does that be, how does that make you a better Latter-day Saint and a better human? Um, okay. <laughs> a big thing I think about agency is like, I get to, wow, this is a, how does that make me a better person? Ugh. It's a big question. Activity rate first. Oh, activity rate first. Oh, Okay. Um, cause I'm sure there's people who are scratching their heads saying, hold up. I mean, we've got a man of lust. He says self, <laughs> a self-admitted luster. Okay. Um, who is already speaking on the fringes when it comes to letter, uh, Mormonism. So how, how do you rate your activity rate or your, your, um, your activity level in the church? You know, every Mormon is a cherry picking Mormon at like, whether they admit it or not, there's no way to swallow the whole religion. So I pick and choose the parts I like. Um, I like the word of wisdom. Don't like the law of chastity. Uh, I like going to church. I go to church every week and singing the songs. And I was asked to speak in church, but I ended up hiking the Arizona Trail instead. So, uh, you know, like, I don't know what the, the line is of, like, active or inactive. It's all just shades of gray to me anyway. So I'm going to say I'm active, but I haven't had a temple recommend in a few years and committed some sins this morning, you know, so, <laughs> <laughs> so there's that and probably won't go to church tomorrow. I'm going camping. So, so we'll, we'll say like 20% active, <laughs> 20%. But it seems like it's not the great message you hear from Mormonism, like when you fall off the path, no happiness, no spiritual experiences, no joy. Do you, is your life void of all of those things? Oh, well, I don't know. The church brings me joy. I like going to church. I love my parents. And the church has brought my parents so much joy and so much purpose. And like, so that's a lot of joy derived from the church. Um, I derive a lot of joy from making friends, going camping. I don't know. Wow. You know, I don't think about my joy too much. I'm just like a happy person that doesn't think too hard about it. Yeah. And I, I, maybe just the picture that I'm, I just see here is that the boundaries were a very healthy thing and self-identification when it comes to your activity levels in the church and, and your ability to connect to the church is a very good thing. Oh yeah. And that it is, it has been, sometimes people just want to paint this with a broad uh, brush of nuance well, you're just nuanced, Paul. You're just, you're a cafeteria, a cafeteria Mormon. Mm -hmm. All you're doing is just picking and choosing what you like. Therefore, you really aren't fully invested into the gospel. But really, if the gospel is a, a message of good news, if it's a message of um, honoring covenants and living to the fullest measure of your creation and doing good for other people, that's all things that I've seen as relatable traits through your story so far. Yeah, I think I'm a good person. In fact, it was for New Year's resolutions. I, I get into New Year's resolutions every year, and my New Year's resolution is, is kind of like a theme. And the theme of this year was Matthew five chapter yeah Matthew five verse nine, which is "Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God." So like that is a verse that's just in my head every morning. And so like my my theme for this year is to be a peacemaker. Uh, yeah, and I think I can do that without keeping the law of chastity. Maybe I can do it better. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. What's your question again? No, I, I, I think you answered. I think you answered it in terms of boundaries. I, I really just, I just want to best understand who Paul Bird is and, and how those boundaries impact um, mm -hmm. your outlook and, and your, your daily life. 
even though it does sound like the law of chastity just isn't the one that or- Orrin Porter Rockwell wants to live today, right? <laughs> Uh, everybody else's sex life is their responsibility unless it involves mine as well. Yeah. And I always think this is a completely different podcast episode, but I'm always <laughs> fascinated by how, how, uh, focused laser focused the church often is on our sex lives, mm-hmm. which is so interesting to me because there you run a global organization with a million other things that you could focus on. But especially when it comes to queer Latter-day Saints, the sex life, the sex life, the sex life, it seems mm-hmm. to be the topics of, of conversation. Um, my like pointed question, you've been pretty honest about sex and sexuality. Um, do you think being open and honest about this topic and having conversations is a good thing for Mormonism? Should, should we be talking more about sex and the law of chastity or the lack of the law of chastity in, in our discussions? Yeah. Yes. Oh, uh, let me put some caveats on that. Um, over the past few weeks, uh, maybe months, I, I, I've been a little bit too simple about it. I was like, people just need to have sex. It solves everything. Like you have financial troubles, just have sex. If you're unhappy, just have sex. Like what's like, what's stopping us? Like if we all just had sex, we'd all have more fun. Uh, it's not that simple. It's, it used to be that simple for me, but it's not that simple. So I see the importance of the law of chastity, I think. You know, like, there's, there's some real, like, emotional bonds you can build with sex, and you don't want to, like, mess with those too hard. So I, I can see, like, maybe where the church is coming from in, like, instituting the law of chastity. Um, but I don't keep it. I don't know. So I, I don't even think I treat sex very respectfully, <laughs> probably. Um, Maybe I do. Who knows? It's all just, I just turn off my brain and I go for it, you know? So, um, I don't know what to say. I, uh, I think it's honest. I, I think what we've <laughs> talked about is, is super honest. Okay. And, it, and it's, these are discussions that we just don't normally have uh, among the Latter-day Saint population. Mainly because when it comes to topics of sexuality or just sex, the word, um, they've also, they've always been cloaked in this, this cover of taboo. Mm-hmm. We don't want to acknowledge this thing that happens to very real people on a very often basis. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's honest to have these conversations. The last part of this podcast, I want to talk a little bit about the future. What does the future look for, look like for Paul Bird? What do you want to see the future look like? You said you haven't had a boyfriend or a girlfriend, um, and I remember reading something that you had posted about uh, your your list of qualifiable <laughs> descriptors for a for a relationship. Okay. Uh, among those was no cats. I do remember that. It was no dogs. Or no dogs. That's right. No dogs. What does the future look like for Paul? <laughs> the that list was a very just silly Facebook post. And I'm always surprised what people hold against me by what I put on Facebook. <laughs> you know, whatever. Who cares? But yes, no dogs. That's the only reason. The only thing I care about. Um, wow. Um, I had a big crush on the guy at the beginning of the summer. He was a wonderful man. Didn't work out, but like, very wonderful man. I, I probably would have... I don't know what I would have done. I would have been his boyfriend. Um, wonderful guy. You know, wish him the best. Um, but I had the butterflies in my stomach for him. I was very attracted to him. And I also like, I like intentionally chose him because, um, there was some quote somewhere that said, love is a choice and you have to continually choose that person. I was like, maybe it's just time to start settling down. I live in my car, you know, I worked at the funeral home and now I work in the wilderness. Like, I'm an artist, like, so I've never had, like, hard and fast plans. I've never had a five-year plan. Um, But there's something in me after I hiked the Arizona Trail. um, Like, maybe I want to settle down at some point in my life. Uh, I've already accomplished all the fun things I want to accomplish. So, so yeah, I started to, like, choose him. Um, You know, it's like, I could have gotten on Grindr or I could have texted this boy. And I would text this boy. You know, just make those kinds of decisions. Just think about him rather than other guys. And, uh, but, you know, the ship has sailed. 
Um, so if that happens again, you know, if I get the butterflies in my stomach or if I get meet a cute boy, um, I will totally pursue that. I'd pursue it now, sure, why not? Except I live in my car, it's kind of hard. Um, and I also live off-grid a lot. <laughs> so, kind of hard. How do you catch a cloud and pin it down, as they say? That's, that's, a, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, what does the future hold? Um, yeah, I don't do five-year plans, Kyle. Love you, but there's no answer. I'm not going to get it out of him. Sorry, <laughs> I, I tried. Well, hey, if any of my listeners want to text me, come on, look me up. I'm down for a date. Yeah. Single, ready to mingle. Hey, no shame in that. <laughs> I do have, uh, I usually wrap the podcast with a list of questions about uh, advice questions. Oh, advice. I love it. Um, what advice would you give to a fellow Latter-day Saint who is active in the church, who identifies somewhere along the spectrum and wants to hold on, um, questioning whether or not there's a place for them in Mormonism? What, what would you? If you were to have that conversation, and I'm sure you have had that conversation with others, what is your advice? Uh, my advice is I value diversity in the church. I value diversity of testimonies. I value diversity of people in the church. Um, if we're all one, one person, I would find that like, I don't find that engaging your agency, actually. And that, I guess that's a whole thing. But like, um, you have to... Mm, you have to be yourself and you have to choose your responsibility and your relationship with the church. So I value it. I value you in the church. I value you out of the church as well. Um, I value more in the church though, because I love the church. And yeah, so that's my advice. I, I value diversity. What is your advice to church leaders? And thinking back to that first stake president uh -huh. who kept you from serving a mission, who knew that you, in a very real sense, were irredeemable because of your sin. What is your advice or message to them? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think I have the answer to that question either. Uh, take care of yourselves. Go home, kiss your wives, take a bath. I don't know. It's a hard job. Um, you know, I don't love that I went through that. I think it was very unfair to me. But uh, it's it's just a mess. I, I don't know. I'm I'm more of the kind to just move on. Don't dwell on it too hard. Uh, policies in the church should change, though. There's some very real policies that need to change. And it's conversations that have been happening a lot, you know, like with Sam Young or John DeLynn or Kate Kelly. I love all of those people so much, by the way. Um, they're trying to change some policies in the church, and that needs to happen. But, you know, the church leaders are people. Take a break. Take a walk. Don't worry too hard about the people in your ward. <laughs> they can take care of themselves. I like it. Uh, and then maybe last to parents, parents who have queer kids who are navigating this journey, uh, especially Latter-day Saint parents with queer kids who mm -hmm. have to navigate this journey without or very little church support mm -hmm. and very little resource available to them. What is your advice to these parents who just had a kid that comes out? Yeah, but it's it's tough for every parent. You see your kid grow up and become an adult, and it's hard. Your kid is growing up, and they will have a life of their own. Um, and I love family bonds. I love my family very dearly, and my parents mean a lot to me. Um, but they are separate people. You know, you got to keep that in mind. Um, so, yeah, I don't have any advice. Sorry. There's other podcasts you can listen to. <laughs> no, I think, that, I think that was fair advice. That, that was a nugget. Was there anything we wanted, you wanted to talk about, you wanted to bring up in this episode that we didn't discuss? Golly. Um, I love these podcasts. I love queer Mormons so much. I don't, I don't know. I love myself. I'm my own best friend. Um... Even with all the heartache and all the bad policies in the church, like I, I choose to look for the good. I choose to see the similarities. This is a funny thing about like there's the two organizations, Affirmation and North Star, and like their ideologies 
seem pretty away from each other. But as far as like the population of those two groups are, is like a Venn diagram with 90% overlap. Um, yeah, so like we have a lot more in common than we have different. Um, and it's easy to focus on the differences, but life is short. I, I just, I focus on what I like about the church. I, I focus on what I like about the boys I like. <laughs> I don't think too hard about what I don't have. I don't think too hard about what I'm missing. And um, yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say. I think we said a lot. We did. And thank you. Thank you for giving us um, a snapshot into the life of the non-pretentious t-shirt wearing <laughs> Paul Bird. Paul Bird. From Tucson, Arizona. Yes, Paul Bird. Look me up on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. One of the I, many adventures that you find yourself on, which I think is a kind of a cool and fun life. Yeah, yeah. Living in my car. <laughs> uh, I, if you want to let me sleep on your couch, anybody out there, I will sleep on your couch. Well, if I'm driving through your town. So... But right now I'm guiding primitive living trips in southern Utah. So Fun. Again, Paul, thank you. Thank you for sharing uh, more of your story. Uh, an interesting look into um, another experience, and I think mm -hmm. which is kind of the beautiful part of episodes like this, is uh, I've often said that there's no one single way to gay. Yeah. And I think there's beauty in this idea that we all have uh, something to offer. And there's all this, everyone has a, a unique ability to uh, impact the outlook of this topic. And so thank you for adding your voice to the chorus. Yeah, thank you for doing this podcast. You're very, very welcome. Again, it's another hour uh, filled with uh, nuggets of information. And we are thankful for Paul for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories podcast. If you are watching on a video version of this podcast and have a comment for Paul, we invite you to comment that below and we can have a discussion. Also, was there something about the episode that resonated? Do you, do you understand it? Do you believe it? Do you uh, disagree with it? I would love to hear what your thoughts are about this episode. Uh, you can also leave that if you are uh, listening or, or watching on a video version in the comments below. And if you are following along on the audio version of the podcast, as always, we invite you to subscribe to this channel. And uh, by subscribing, you will get notified as soon as we uh, release uh, new episodes through Latter Gay Stories so you can find out what's going on in the community. The Latter Gay Stories podcast is your opportunity to better understand the intersection of sexuality and religion. But most importantly, it's stories like yours and Paul's that help us each continue writing our own Latter Gay Story.